about five months into my time interrogating at Abu Ghraib, um, I had completed about 100 combat interrogations. Overwhelmingly, over 95% of those people were like taxi drivers, young fathers, local laborers, imams, veterans of previous Iraqi wars, not terrorists, not insurgents. And um, after that time of five months worth of interrogating. I finally interrogated a, a man who was a self-declared jihadi. He was Saudi Arabian, came to Iraq specifically to fight jihad. It's so a part of me said, well, finally, you know, I'm finally not, you know, just dancing interrogatives with taxi drivers. I'm actually going to be talking to the real deal. And um, he, uh, um, he had a pretty thick file. Um, and all detainees that we interrogate have files that accompany them so we know where they've been, who's interrogated them, what information has been gleaned. And um, the, the file said that essentially everything that had, that had been learned, he had offered up voluntarily. I thought, what in the world kind of a person volunte volunteers to the U.S. Army that you're um, a jihadi from Saudi Arabia, you went through this entrance way, you stopped in this city with this, these arms caches. Who in the world does that? That's basically saying, I want to spend the rest of my life in prison. And uh, because the going law was that if you were a threat to coalition forces, we had the right to kill or capture you. The interrogation begins and he walks very, very calmly into the room. And I didn't like the fact that he was being so polite. And for an interrogator, an interrogator always has to be the force of authority. And when a person um, submits to authority, in a, he was submitting to my authority in a, in a very confident kind of way. And I wanted to make sure he did it because he had to, not because he wanted to. So um, I ordered him um, to sit in his chair, to keep his feet in, on, the, on the floor, his hands at his side, and, and his eyes on me at all times. I asked him questions repeatedly, uh, quickly, in order to kind of trip up his train of thought. Uh, and in this kind of followed suit with most of the emotionally or verbally aggressive interrogations I'd had for those five months leading up to it. And the more I did that, the, the more he just kind of rolled with the punches. And, um, and I actually got pretty tired of, of trying to trip him up, and so I've, I, I switched gears a little bit. So I asked him, I asked him a quick question. And I thought that I was kind of being clever by asking him this. I said, you know, why did you come to Iraq to kill? And um, he had talked kind of about the an almost just war understanding of, of jihad. And so I, I didn't want to give him the upper hand by, by talking about um, his, his mission. I, I said, why did you come here to kill? And he, he flatly looked back at me and he said, why did you come here to kill? I said, I, I didn't come here to kill. I came here to, to do my job and to defend the Iraqi people. He said, if, if you're kind of a strange man, um, if, if the military, you know, if the U.S. didn't want people to be killed, they would have sent someone else, not soldiers. Soldiers are sent when people need to be killed. And, uh, um, and I said, well, I have a duty to my country, and I'm fulfilling that duty. And... Somehow this, the conversation switched gears again and we started talking about ethics and the cycle of vengeance and the fact that he had, been, had come to Iraq um, under the, the, uh, the Muslim understanding of jihad and his, his, his understanding of jihad is that it's the duty of Muslims to protect Muslim lands when they are invaded by a foreign and non-Muslim army. And um, which was interesting because it it kind of came back to the same sound I was raising over duty that he came here because it was his duty to defend Muslim lands. And um, after we talked a little bit about this, he, he looked at me. He looked at me and he said, um, he said again, you know, you're a very strange man. Uh, you said earlier that you're a Christian, but you don't follow the teachings of Christ to love your enemies, to pray for those who persecute you, to turn the other cheek. And uh, I thought, well, this is kind of an ironic moment, Joshua. Here you are s sitting across the table from a declared jihadist, um, and he's giving you a lesson on the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I didn't really take his personal challenge all that incredibly seriously, because previously in the conversation he had told me that um, he would perhaps kill me if he had the, if he had the chance. But all of this was, was 
um, an exterior that he put on. If I can elaborate on that, um, this was a 22-year-old kid from Saudi Arabia who had never fired a gun in his life. He'd been picked up by the coalition two weeks after he entered Iraq. Um, and at the time, I was a 24-year-old kid from Iowa. Um, I'd never had to fire a weapon in combat. You know, I'd learned how to fire my weapon plenty, but I'd, I, we were both, he and I, were both idealistic kids, devoted to our people, devoted to our religions, and uh, willing to, um, to kill and to sacrifice um, on this occasion. And yet he was the person who told me to follow the teachings of Jesus. He was the one who told me I had to follow the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount. And I didn't tell him that. And I, after he, he told me that I, that I wasn't following the teachings of Jesus, I was completely silent. And, and I, I finally said, you know, I think, I think actually you're right. Um, there, there's something wrong here. Um, because wouldn't it be great if 10 years from now, I'm not a soldier and you're not in prison and we, we, we took a, a separate path together, both you and I. You, know, you live in a system that tells you you're justified to kill me. I live in a system that tells me I'm justified to kill you. What if we were both to put down those weapons and to find a different path? Um, and I realized at that point I had, I had lost my objectivity as an interrogator and I wasn't doing my job. The textbook definition of interrogation is to exploit the greatest amount of intelligence in the least amount of time. But certainly, I wasn't doing that any longer in the interrogation. Um, and I, I realized that what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk to him about the cycle of vengeance. And I wanted to talk to him about religion and, and, and what in the world we, you know, how it was that um, you know, a brown-eyed, brown-headed Saudi Arabian kid was sitting next to a blonde-headed, blue-eyed Christian kid from Iowa um, and we were talking about Islam, Christianity, Jesus, and the cycle of vengeance. And, um, but it, it was my duty to, um, uh, to exploit him of his information. So I, I stopped the interrogation and I went to my chain of command and I said, um, I've lost my objectivity as an interrogator. If you, if, if you want information, from this guy, you're gonna to have to send somebody else in because if I go back in that room, I'm gonna see a 22-year-old kid who's looking for answers. And I didn't say this, but this was essentially what I meant. I'm a 24-year-old kid looking for answers, um, and um, I don't care to exploit him of his information. I want to talk to him man to man. I want to talk to him about the things that matter to him and to me. And that eventually crystallized for me the fact that I had to take off the uniform. I had to choose a different path. That I was submitting myself to a system that said, what's important is not who you are, but what you do. You need to do these things. But my identity as a Christian said um, um, that my value comes in my identification with Christ and my, um, my um, um, my willingness to, to do things like lead by example. I, in that situation with the Saudi Arabian, I was supposed to have the answers. I was supposed to have the answers for him and supposed to be able to say, you know, I've taken a different path and I'm living proof. But I, I couldn't have done those things because I was fulfilling a duty that, um, that gave me a different identity. And so I ended up applying for conscientious objection. Uh, when we came back to the States, um, I officially submitted my application and I was discharged about three months later.